Um, Manny, what made you decide to invest in mining in the Philippines? Well, it's, I think, generally recognized that the Philippines is a highly mineral, mineralized country. And uh, we, we, we agree with that assessment. So we thought we should invest in a, in a vital industry that could help contribute to, you know, to the overall economic development of the country. And, you know, in the earlier days of my work, uh, in the 70s, uh, the largest listed companies actually in the, in the Philippine Stock Exchange were the mining companies, you know, the, the old ones like Atlas, uh, Lepanto, uh, Felix, Benguet, Marinduque. So, so it's, it's, it's for us a, an attempt at uh, reviving uh, the, the industry which was uh, flourishing. Well, how different is mining and gas and extractive industries from the companies that you were running? It's, it's, in a way, it's different because we go to the very heart of natural resource development, uh, say, opposed to infrastructure or uh, utilities. No? Food. For food, yes, yes. Although, as you know, we're also interested in agriculture in getting, in really developing something from, so to speak, from the ground up. No? You bought Felix in 2008. Um, political environment. How how have things changed from 2008 until today? Um, well, there's I guess there's two things. One is a, uh, a more intense debate about the attraction of mining uh, as such to the country, and of course a as a I guess a consequence of that uh, debate, a further articulation of of the mining policy by the government no? as expressed in the recent Executive Order 79 and the recently issued uh, Implementing Rules and Regulations. And how would you assess both EO 79 and the IRR? Well, I, I think it's an attempt, I believe it's an attempt to, uh, to balance uh, the interests of the industry and the interests of, if you may, the environmentalists. No? Um, I would frankly say the jury is still out in terms of whether uh, that balance, I mean as a, as a goal it is, it is a noble one. I, I have no problem with trying to balance interests between the environment and, and business. Uh, I think the jury is out in terms of whether that kind of balance that uh, the government is trying to strike is promotive of, uh, of the business interests as such of the industry and promotive of, of of the future of mining in this country. You know? There are, uh, I think, some good things about uh, the EO and the IRR and areas of concern about uh, the EO and the IRR itself. No? The EO, before it can actually be implemented, um, ha needs to go through legislation in Congress. How are you looking at the upcoming battle in Congress? In terms of the EO? Yes. Um, oh, sorry, it's already implemented. It's already but, implemented, But there are still factors that need to be fought in Congress. Well, I suppose if there are new taxes to be imposed, they have to go to Congress because the taxing authority, I believe, yes. is understand it. The mining employ. reform bill. Yeah, we'll have to go, have to, Congress, go to Congress. Right? Uh, there are alternatives that we would like to suggest uh, to the government with respect to to uh, the desire of government to have the increased share of revenues or profits, as, it, as, a, as the case may be, from, from the industry. And it's a measure that we have, since my mining speech um, sometime a million years ago, uh, that we support. I think uh, the natural resource is a patrimony of the country. It belongs to, to the country. And uh, the government's desire to have an increased share is something we will support. Uh, we, and, um, but, you know, the way it could be done is something we would like to put our suggestions as to how that can be achieved. No? Uh, for example, our belief is that instead of imposing additional taxes based on gross revenues of, of the industry, it should be a, a essentially a share of the net mining revenues. Uh, because the, the, the basic philosophy behind that thinking is that uh, we have no control over the prices of metals at all. No? The mining industry is so small 
to this economy and certainly to the global economy. And, uh, you know, uh, there have been periods of the global industry, mining industry where prices have dropped precipitously and prices have risen as they have in recent years. So I think the government should participate in the, in the upside, but I think should be a party to the downside as well, to which both of us don't have any control over. And I think it's a fair, it's a fair distribution of risk, bearing in mind that the total investment risk is on the private sector shoulders. No? The government has no money on the table, so to speak, and if, if, if it's a dry hole, so to speak, uh, with respect to, to, uh, to mining resources by a private party trying to explore and uh, develop the resource, there's no requirement, obligation, or obligation on the part of the government to reimburse us for what we've spent. So it's totally risk money on the part of the private sector. So um, a 50-50 sharing, for example, which is uh, the, the uh, regulation under FTAA is for us an eminently uh, reasonable way of sharing uh, the risks and the profits that the mining company de derives. No? In other countries, it goes as high as 60-40, is that right? Um, Could be, yes, yes. Um, it's the same, it's a similar uh, rule that applies to, as we understand it, to oil and gas uh, contracts uh, globally. No? In terms of, of uh, this kind of revenue share, how, how protracted do you see this, this debate well, it's going? over the, the life of the mine essentially. Because, you know, if you charge uh, taxes on gross, it is possible if commodity prices were to collapse that the mining company loses money and yet continues to pay taxes to the government. Of course, the government can, uh, at that point in time, take away the, the excess tax, but, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a shutdown point for that particular company. If it were losing money and at the same time is obligated to, to pay uh, the same level of taxes you know, under a, an environment where commodity prices are high. Go high. Let's go back to something, though, you mentioned, which is, um, can, is responsible mining possible? Um, Why not? It, it is possible in other parts of the world. And uh, to, for us to tell ourselves that we cannot do what the Australians are doing, or the Americans, or the South Africans, or even the Indonesians, is something that, you know, is, is that something that we'd like to tell ourselves? Is that something acceptable to us as a people? Do we, do we want to define ourselves as a people, as people who cannot do what others can do? I don't think so. I, it's something I can't accept, no? Um, I think it's as simple as that. We, 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 we should be able to manage our affairs in whatever business you're in. Or any human activity, right? It's it's not the fault of the business. There are risks always to business, and uh, we should develop the appropriate management mechanisms and the the strong institutions that enable this country to manage affairs better. I mean, it, it's really quite simple as that. And then we are telling ourselves, well, uh, let's put a break on mining or any, say, any other business because we cannot manage the affairs of mining or of that particular business. I mean, I, I can't subscribe to that belief. Well, for the longest time, Felix was the poster child for responsible mining, but the Padcal mine happened. How, how did it affect you? What lessons did you get, did you learn from it? Well, there, there are uh, risks attendant to this, to this business that are probably not applicable to other businesses, albeit, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the, the accident acquires the character of force majeure because, you know, act, nature acting on its own or on her own really, uh, we, we believe, uh, cause a particular accident. Of course, typhoons also cause Meralco wires to go down and even PLDTs and smart uh, networks to go down if there are natural incidents. No? Yes. But um, yeah, it's, 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 it's unfortunate. It's something we 
did not foresee nor are we happy about, but it has happened and we're doing our best to, uh, to remedy the situation as quickly as we can. So you're saying that risk is always there regardless? Yeah, I think so. That's why we have to, even in our particular case, to be honest, we, we just have to manage our own affairs better than we have in the past. No? And um, yeah, it's a, it's a lesson for us. We, the, uh, the discharge happened on, at around 11 p.m. of July 31st and uh, the people from Patkal immediately contacted Jules to advise him that there is a problem with the pond and Jules called me at around midnight of August the 1st and we had a fairly long conversation and at the end of it I told Jules, Jules we don't want to compound the problem on the pond and the discharge, why don't you shut down the mine? And he, he agreed. Uh, it, it dawned on us that that's the most prudent thing to do, and, uh, and we did. And the mine has been shut down since August the 1st to this day, and will probably be shut down till the end of the year until we're able to, to really develop a, a viable alternative and solution to, to the discharge. And the following day, we, we, we went public with the problem. We owned up to the problem. Others pointed out that was the f one of the first times that that's also happened, so an industry change. But Yes, we, uh, as I understand, there was an article that Mike Toledo passed on to me. He, I, I understand in other parts of the world as well, uh, these nasty lawyers uh, have a habit of covering up <laughs> any kind of accident. So, But what damage did you assess the damage that happened after the, the leaks? And there were several of them, right? Yes, yes. Well, it's, it's really the discharge onto the Balog Creek and to the junction of the Balog Creek and the Agno River. Uh, the, the discharge is in the nature of, of really real fine sand, the ground uh, or uh, that represents the tailings, the, the, the residu residue of the, of, the, of the mining operations. Uh, some chemicals that are added into the process which are non-toxic we have uh, pointed it out. So um, th those are the net effects on, on, on the environment. Any lessons, lear lessons learned? Well, um, it is likely we will condemn the pond. We don't want to take a risk on the continued usage of the pond. I think as soon as we are able to effectively and for a and consistently plug the, the sinkhole, uh, we are likely to condemn it totally. We're now in the process of looking at alternative uh, sites for a new tailing pond, and we will build, we will ensure that the build out of that new pond or ponds are, uh, you know, foolproof as we can make it, or as nature will allow us to make it. No? What does that mean financially for Felix now? Well, it, it's um, setting aside the penalties that uh, may be imposed on us. Uh, it's 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 um, it's it's severe. It's substantial, as well. We had forecasted uh, profits for this year of about four billion pesos. It's likely to drop to something between 1.5 to 1.7 billion. It's, it's a significant penalty. Yes. Um, let me bring you back to the EO and the IRR. Um, you talked a little bit about the revenue sharing, but. We noticed that after EO 79 was passed, a lot of the plans for new mining, a lot, a lot of investment in new mines also pulled back uh, a bit. Uh, what's the impact of this on new investors in mining? It, it adds a bit more uncertainty to the, uh, to the investment. Um, the good points about the EO and the IRR are well, what I mentioned, I think the governments. Uh, attempt to uh, get more revenues out of the industry and I think we talked about it and that's that that yes. we think as a basis no? uh, as well when the when the EO affirmed the supremacy of national laws over local laws and the mandate to but to that's approve. also um, very controversial right now in terms of well, implementation right? Uh, yes because it's sort of it's it's this attempt to balance things, right? I mean, you know, you affirm that, and yet at the same time, there are statements uh, being made publicly uh, by government that, uh, as in the specific case of Tampakan, that the ordinances 
uh, that are extant with respect to open pit mining and national laws will not be implemented until this ordinance is somehow resolved by the by the courts which you know which so where are we in terms of uh, saying one thing and not quite uh, doing it no so I think that that I would as I understand it would might uh, you know I'm not involved with Tampakan so that might mm -hmm. cause a bit of uncertainty on the part of the owners of Tampakan then of course the mandate is a good one the mandate to approve exploration permits within the period of six months and the general tone of the EO, EO to expedite cut down red tape in terms of approvals of right. permits and um, and the like and licenses no um, but there are concerning areas like uh, the ability to close um, parts of a particular mining concession if it's determined that uh, some other business is uh, quote appropriate unquote for that for those areas like tourism no? so um, so it, it probably does for us it could get into some legal issues uh, in fact as again I'm not a lawyer as I understand it the Constitution our Constitution and the Mining Act in, uh, uh, affirm the primacy of uh, mineral resources and their development mm -hmm. and mineral rights over any other business mm -hmm. so f I mean f for the EO to say that that's not quite the case I, I don't know how we're gonna resolve that that, that that particular issue. Then there are issues surrounding about renewal of mining agreements uh, and in fact the ability of government to renegotiate existing mining arrangements, no? the terms thereof. So, um, so it goes to the very heart of contract rights and uh, basic human rights. Uh, so it affects obviously local, the local environment and even international environment because the Philippines has international treaties with respect to contractual arrangements. No? So it sounds like the level of uncertainty increased significantly. Is that a correct statement? Well, I don't want to, to exaggerate the, the, these concerns, but you know, it, it, it does go to, to, to certain basic... Well, from uh, what you said, um, if the concessions are out, but it's unclear in terms of revenue sharing, um, in terms of, of the, which, law, which law moves forward, how, I guess this is what I'm basing uh, it on. If you're an, a new investor coming into the Philippines, is mining attractive? From a potential perspective, yes. From a regulator, per regulator perspective, I'm not sure. It's still fair to say that the Philippines is fifth largest in the world in terms of mining resources, so the mining is there, right? Um, so what has changed from the time you bought Felix in 2008 until today now that has increased these well, risks? Well, from a resource perspective, nothing has changed. I don't think uh, uh, the span of four years uh, has, has diminished mm -hmm. or enhanced the mineral resources of the country. I'm, I'm just being facetious. Yes, you are. <laughs> <laughs> uh, because, you know, there's been no boom, no mining boom as such that significantly diminished right. the natural resource of this the country. The resources are still there. Still there. But so uh, the question is, have we, have we created the environment that is uh, appropriate for a ripening of, of an industry that... Uh, that uh, we think is a big potential for this country. Um, um, yeah, that, that's, that's not clear to me, to be honest. Can I ask you about Reed Bank, which is a huge find um, that you have and you're sitting on top of and could potentially actually pay for many things and, and pave the way for better relations with China. Could you tell us where you are in that and what I know it's not quite mining, but oil and gas. The, the <laughs> SE72. Yes, to yes. Bank, I mean, and, uh, tell us a little bit more. Um, it's supposed to bring in a certain amount of money, but is, can you move forward on this, on this deal? Well, we, we'd like to. Um, so far, at least with respect to oil and gas exploration, it hasn't it hasn't fetched the kind of intensive debate that it, as it has in the case of mining. 
the, the, the main issue is a, is a sovereignty one, a political one, with respect yes. to, to SC-72 in particular. And uh, who, who can mine this? I mean, who can actually extract the gas in this area, in the South China Sea? Exactly. And you are in talks with CNOOC. Yes, yes. Um, How much is the potential find there that you found? Well, uh, it could be, you know, uh, the, if you may, the, um, uh, the initial estimates, and I must stress initial and tentative um, estimates are anywhere from the, about the size of Malampai to something bigger than Malampai. How, just how bigger it is compared to Malampai is an open question. We do have to do more surveys. Mm -hmm. We need to do more exploratory drilling, mm -hmm. assessment wells. Uh, in the area, so the issue has always been: uh, will when if we do send our ships and oil rigs in that area, what will Gi China do? No? And of course, indeed, what will our government do uh, in the event that there is a some some sort of confrontation? Yeah. Do you are you closer? I mean, we're talking tens of millions of dollars of investments uh, yes. over the next yes. year. I mean, are you closer to any kind of? resolution or getting to a point no. of agreement. Okay. Not at all. <laughs> oh. Um, I know that the, the Secretary of Energy was actually looking at that as a potential income flow that of could course. help offset of the high course. price of electricity. Of course. We've had studies uh, done by Miralco. Yes. And the most recent one, which I think is the most comprehensive and I think the most intellig intelligent research was done by this consultant based in, in Singapore. And essentially, it came to the conclusion that uh, if you if you um, abstract the rates out of the subsidies that other governments uh, allow with respect to their own domestic uh, power rates, we are comparable. We are not we are not at the higher end of the range of power prices. Now, if you want to bring power rates down, you have to take certain steps. The most basic one is that. If you can develop your indigenous source of fuel, yes. as you earlier alluded, then it will help yes. bring down power rates. And yes. of course, so long as the government doesn't tax yes. too much the, 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 the basic source of fuel. Imagine if we could encourage more exploration of coal mines in this country, Correct. of oil and gas uh, areas. So if we develop our own, so it's a it looks like it's a chicken or egg situation. You bring the prices down if you have your own sources of, of yes, res and therefore there's got to be a determined and decisive effort at exploring and developing your resources, be it oil, gas, coal, or whatever. At least in that aspect of power, right? But if that logic were to apply for that industry, why can't it apply to mining as well? So long as you are for responsible mining, and you have the institutions and companies that follow the right rules for responsible mining. So uh, let, let me go back though, the, ta the mine tailings seem to have hit mining to a degree. Again. Yes, unfortunately it comes at the wrong time, but you know, that's how problems arise, right? It right. comes at the most unfortunate time. You don't have control over when your problems could arise. Right. And from what you've seen, this isn't a particular Felix problem. You're you're saying that this is force majeure. I mean, is there something Felix did wrong that it could do better? I I don't know, Maria, because well, to begin with, this is a bit of a cop out. Uh, the tailings pond were built uh, was built already when we came in, yes. and um, and how it happened is still something we haven't defined. Uh, Comprehensively, you know. Yes. So, uh, so it's it's. It, I think we'll get there. I think when the full report and investigation of this accident comes out, then we will have a better view of what. what well, to you're say. certainly absorbing the loss by shutting down immediately, Absolutely. right? Um, Absolutely. And then the fines should be there. Uh, if you move forward, so you're talking about the investments that go into these extractive industries. What problems need to be addressed to actually? get to the point that you're talking about, where, where it's attractive to investors and at the same time sustainable? Well, I, I think you have to address the certain areas of concern that the EO and the IRR have raised. Um, I guess the good thing about it is that it has raised it to the fore yes. for everybody to see. And um, 
if we are able to address those areas of concern that we have, and I think the industry has as well, uh, you know, that, that is satisfactory to this country, then perhaps we can move forward. Um, um, I, I think at the end of the day, at the end of the day, Maria, it's, it's really a question of um, what is the bias, what is the direction of policy towards mining? And if I had my druthers, I would prefer that that be clearer. Because if the bias is not for mining, then so be it. Uh, if the mining industry in its entirety were to shut down today, the world would just simply just stifle a yawn. Said, oh, that's interesting. The Philippines has shut down its mining industry. Will it have an impact on global metal prices? Absolutely not. The world would probably say that's unfortunate, but life will go on in other parts of the mining world. No? And um, I guess my point is that if it, it, it's from that uh, bias direction, I think will flow how you wish to regulate a particular business. Right? At this point, it is not clear to me where the, I mean, the, the attempt to balance it, uh, I think, creates uh, these areas of concern that need to be further resolved, in, in, our, in my view. No? It sounds like it's a great period of uncertainty. Yes, because they, they can close areas of your mining tenements. They can renegotiate terms of the contract. They're now saying, under the Mining Act, you have automatic renewal for another 25 years under your contractual arrangements. They're now saying that's not, that's not the case. So there's a legal aspect to it. Can they do that? without amending the, the Mining Act, or is that a fair arrangement by which mining companies have been putting a lot of money if the horizon has shrunk from effectively 50 years down to 25 years? So it's, it's, these, are, these have material uh, aspects, both from a legal perspective and a business perspective. Correct. The so environment. It's, it's, it's the, the impact of the IRR particularly is, uh, is quite, uh, maybe it hasn't been anticipated, but it is, it is more substantial than one would imagine. No. If environmental activists are saying that the mining companies had more of a say in it, and yet from what I'm hearing from you now, it sounds like uh, your, the industry's concerns may not also have been pushed forward. Is anyone happy with, with EO79 yeah. and the IRR? Well, I don't think the industry is happy with it, I think. Uh, have the rules changed in the middle of the game? I believe they have. They so have. Yeah, I think it's an attempt to articulate further the, what the policy should be on mining. And I, I think the good side about it is that it has raised issues. And so I think we just need to jointly, uh, what the industry got to work together with government in trying to uh, arrive at a solution. Last words, I mean, in terms of the industry today, how would you, describe it? I, I think we should continue to, to advocate for the benefits of the, that the mining industry could bring to, to the people, no? Um, and, and not get phased by, you know, the, these, these areas of concern that I've mentioned to you. And there are more of them that I've not yet fully described. And uh, because it flows from our conviction that it's, it's properly managed, mining as a business uh, should be good for the country, its people. Um, that reflects uh, the, our group's conviction and frankly also my personal conviction that in terms of in, 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 in assessing and weighing uh, the priorities uh, of this country, and I hope I can speak uh, as a Filipino, that for me, economic welfare is paramount, right? So we should promote businesses that enhance precisely economic welfare of people. Uh, I'd like to think that uh, you and I are not the typical Filipino uh, who have got to 
subsist and worry about the next meal mm -hmm. uh, or find a job or find a shelter, find shelter uh, or education or whatever, clothes for your, for your kids. And uh, so for us, uh, economic welfare is paramount. I think it can remedy a lot of the social ills we're seeing in this country. So um, I, that would be my, my, my priority. No? Um, sure, the environment is, is important for us, uh, but in the scale of things, it's, it's when you see the plight of the poor mm. here, it is, it, is, it is an affront to human dignity when they live the way they do, uh, or eat the way they do, or don't work as we work, no? so uh, that's something uh, I think the industry should not turn its back on and say, look, uh, it's good, it can be done the proper way, and as I keep making the point that if others can do it, why can't we, why can't we, right? Um, okay. okay, thank you so much. We've been speaking with Manny Pangilinan. He heads the Philippines' largest mining company, Felix. Thank you for joining us.